Hi everybody, welcome to the Photographer Academy and another great webinar tonight. It's all about shooting bands and we've got that man from overseas, uh, George, Fair, uh, George Fairburn, who kind of is a common man amongst our land in the UK now. George, hi mate, how are you doing? Yeah, very good, how are you? I'm older, greyer and fatter, but that's a whole different discussion like I'm going to my doctor. I'm sure you're a lot better than I am. <laughs> Cool, George, uh, I'm not going to delay. Let's uh, change you over the screen. I'll give it to you now, and then we'll get going with tonight's webinar. Enjoy it, guys. Okay. We will be doing questions as we go through, so if you actually want to add anything in, just had, uh, put them into the question panel, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask them with the relevant photographs. So, George, I believe if you show your screen, we should be able to see it. There we go. Now we're seeing the band. Okay. Is it just the band? It is just the band. Okay, good. It's showing you the right screen then. Okay. Thanks, um, okay. Any more, Mark, or should I start firing away? Fire away, mate. It's all, it's all yours now. Okay. So uh, if anybody's got any questions while I'm going through, feel free to just say them when they come up. If it's something I'm going to talk about later, I'll say I'm going to come to that. Uh, but basically, I've got this broken down into three sections that I will try to ensure we got. But basically, I shoot bands for a living. Um, it's not 100% of my income, but it is probably 90% of my income. Uh, and it comes from three different areas, and that's the three areas I wanted to talk about. And would be direct commissions from bands. So bands come to me or can come to me and they want photos from me for their publicity, their PR, their album covers, whatever it might be. Uh, the second aspect would then be from magazines, from various editorials that I shoot. I shoot for magazines like Kerrang! and Total Guitar and Rhythm. Um, and those are a completely different beast to shoot than for the bands themselves, and that's kind of why I got those split into two different sections. Uh, and then the last one would be shooting gigs, um, which is the least money and probably the hardest. <laughs> but um, that's at the end, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that last. Uh, but basically what I want to do, the first section, so the first five images are going to be bands that wanted me to take photos for them. And we'll start with this one here. And I've got a little highlighter thing here as well. So if anybody's got any questions um, and you want something specific, I can draw and like point a little arrow at the bald guy's head and say, you know, whatever it is I'm going to say about that. So um, <clears throat> we'll talk about this, this image first. So this band, unfortunately, this band is no longer around. Um, but they were called the Manic Shine. And when they came to me, they wanted to uh, play on the name of the band without being cliche about it. And that's one of the things you'll find is that a lot of bands don't want cliche images. And it's really easy to fall into the sort of cliche trap with bands and find some old railroad tracks or photograph them in an alley and give them really moody lighting. Um, this is a metal band, and they know that with a metal band, it's really easy to get cliche about it. And they said, we don't want it to be cliche, but we want it to be a little bit of a play on our name. So after some weird emails back and forth, we came to the decision to try to do the shoot in a laundrette, uh, which we did. Now, getting permission for the laundrette was a nightmare, and that would take up two hours for me to explain to you how I got permission. And I bring that up because I get emails weekly about this photo of somebody asking me how they, I got permission to shoot there. Um, but that's another topic. So for this, lighting on this one was really easy and really a bit unusual for me. I tend to shoot a lot. Well, I used to shoot a lot with more than one light, and it used to always be three. Um, but I've kind of really been paring that down a lot lately, and actually looking through the images I'm going to be showing you tonight, I think the vast majority might just be one light. Um, so this, this image is one light. 
Now, normally, with something like this, with a band, and I'll show you that in some images coming ahead, um, the key with one light is to kind of light the singer like you were going to give him butterfly lighting. And then when everybody else is sort of arranged around him, the lighting will fall off onto them in, you know, loop or Rembrandt or split, even depending on how big the band is. With this, this was a very narrow um, location, and so I couldn't do that with my light. So my light is very much just camera left, and you can tell, you can see that looking at the guy on the right, how he's got much more Rembrandt lighting. Um, but I think when it comes to bands, you got to kind of also throw a little bit of like the rules out the window, and I don't want to say throw the rules out the window, but there's certain things in like a band photo I would never do in a normal photo. And like the, if you look at the guy on the left, his hands hanging in his lap. In a normal portrait, never in a million years would I allow that to happen because it doesn't look good in like a fashion photo or something like that. Uh, but with bands, you've got to let them sort of show their personality. And the nice thing with, with bands is they're performers and they're creative people in their own right. And for the most part, they have absolutely no issue being in front of the camera and no issue giving you their face. And you can see that in this photo. Every one of them is giving me their face. Um, and that's real key with photographing bands and their personality through because with social media now, um, odds are if you haven't heard the band before, before you ever hear a note of their music, you're going to see a picture of them. Um, and so the image of the band probably has never played a more important role than it does now. So saying that, the next band... Stay on that for a minute. You know, yeah. well, sorry, what's that? First. Ooh, sorry, what was that? Sorry, mate, can we just go back to the last shot? Just a couple of questions on there, if that's okay. Yep. Do you use, oh, uh, yep, yep, yep. Do you use Big Flash with this, or are you a Speedlight user? Uh, no, this is LM. I use LM for virtually everything nowadays. I use the Quadra Rangers, um, and then this one would have been with the Quadra Rangers a large octobox. I couldn't tell you the exact size on that octobox, actually. Um, uh, are you ever tempted to bring I'm out a second? For you. Great, sorry. Um, are you ever tempted to use a second mm -hmm. head when you're shooting big bands for either accent or to light from the other side? Yes. Um, yes. And I used to always do that. Uh, but I think it's been somewhat dictated by locations lately and then somewhat dictated by just the way my style is developing um, and then I don't do it quite as much. Um, but I used to. I used to all the time, especially with more metal bands. I would give them what I would call my metal band lighting setup, which was like one bare light really low to the ground behind the band and then whatever light I was do in the front. Um, and that would always give you that really dark shadows coming at the camera. Um, and that worked quite well for metal bands. It doesn't work for pretty much any other genre of music, um, but it does with metal. Um, but yeah, I've kind, of, I've kind of just gone away from it a bit lately. Um, not intentionally, it's just one of those things that slowly started I think that answers that question. It does. Last one. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, brilliant. Um, can you just say something uh, as far as the glass in the uh, the dryers or the tumble washing machines in the background? Have you done post to that, or is it um, something that you did on the shoot to actually stop the reflection? Good question. Um, that was just down to the light position. So besides it being very narrow. Um, the, the, the reflection coming from the washing machines in the back also dictated how light was going to go. So the light, besides being to the left of the camera, is also pointing not at them at all. Like it's pointing straight across my lens. 
and then so the light's just feathering onto them as opposed to falling on them directly and that helps mitigate because if you can my the rule with this stuff and it's a bit hard with something like this but any mirrors or any glass or anything like that and when you're looking through the viewfinder if you can see your light in that in a reflection uh, then you need to move it um, and with this there was nowhere I could put it where I wasn't going to see it but by turning it so I couldn't see where it was coming out from that got rid of any of the reflections so right, the lights pointing pretty much right right and then just feathering onto them okay thanks George see the next photograph I hope that makes sense. no it does yeah. great thanks Wade. okay so this is another one <laughs> um, like I said, I, I'm looking through the ones I'm going to be showing you today, and the vast majority of them one light um, um, shots, which is unusual, although not so much now. But what I was saying at the end of that last one about the image needing to really portray not only the personalities of the band, but the music of the band as well, uh, this image shows that to a T. This is a band I've been photographing for years and years and years, and I think you might start hearing some from them soon uh, because they're actually getting a little bit of recognition in um, But it's a band called Hello Bear, and they're very fun. Um, I don't want to call them pop punk because they would hate if I said that, uh, but they're very much a fun band. Um, they have song titles that are just absurd and to do with the actual song itself and they're just all about having fun and that's what this photo tried to show as well you know they're just quirky um, they, they sing a lot of songs about sweets uh, and they're just a bit strange and because I've worked with them so much they're very comfortable to do whatever whatever I want and I just asked Tom uh, the bass player there I'm like just what would it look like if you go upside down and he, he did it um, and it just made the photo a hundred times better because it just adds that weird wonkiness to the entire image um, and it just catches your eye and that's that's really what bands need nowadays because like I said they're gonna social media people are gonna see a picture before they ever hear a note of music if they've never heard the band before and they need something like this um, but again, this was one light, um, and you can kind of see from the lighting setup, this was pretty much dead on, so that I'm giving the guy, Luke, there, who's the one sitting forward, um, he's got pretty much butterfly lighting on his face. And then, because I use the large Octobox, it doesn't change too much from everybody else going backwards. Uh, but I will move on, unless there's questions on this one answered where the light was so it's basically high and above them yeah pointing down yeah yeah it's yeah it's pretty much centered on the singer who's the guy leaning forward um just position pointing down a little bit on him <coughs> thanks george for that one yeah all right so this one <coughs> this one i put in here um because it's a rather unique, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a rather unique scenario how this image came about. So this is a, a YouTuber who also does music. Her name is Emma Blackery. Um, she does very pop punk um, music, but you would never know that judging from this photo. So what happened is she contacted me to shoot her album cover. And I said, okay, yeah, that sounds good. And we'll do some PR photos as well. And so we found this really cool location after talking about everything in London. And it was these nomadic gardens. And we did lots of typical photos you would expect on the day. Uh, lots of pop punk things, her having fun and, you know, uh, everything that you would expect. And then it came time to do what was going to be the album cover. And the idea at the time for it was to do just a really nice uh, headshot for her. And it was just going to be a sort of headshot as an album cover, like Adele. If you picture Adele's album cover, that's what this was going to be. 
But when we were walking around these nomadic gardens, I saw this bathtub, and it was just filled with dirt. And I said, oh, man, that would be really cool to do a shoot in. She's like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Um, so she just hopped in. Um, she hopped into the bathtub, lied down on the dirt. I got my light together. And um, with this, it's the first time I've ever photographed somebody lying down on the ground where I was standing up. <coughs> Sorry about that. So it took me a minute to sort of work through my head how to light it. Um, but in the end, came to because it's really difficult to light a person that's lying on the ground. And I didn't think that would be very difficult. Um, but it is. It's hard to visualize where you need to put the light. But you can see, if you can see the shadow on, on her nose here. Oh, I just clicked through something. Sorry. Um, her nose. That's not her nose. Um, here, you can see I had I ended up positioning the camera, the light, off to the camera left, and then behind her a little bit to give it lighting, but while she was lying down. And then this was just like a throw-in shot. And the whole point of me putting it in there is don't be afraid to just throw other things in that you see. This was just a throw and an extra throw in shot and it was the one that she ended up using to be her album cover, um, which was cool with me because it looks good and it looks really good as an album cover. But I'll move on unless there's questions on this one. There's a question about post-production and a, well several of them um, and there's a question about um, getting a stage passes and things. Do you want to talk about those now or later or later on? <coughs> stage passes we'll talk about later on. And if we run out of time before I get to that, I will make sure I talk about it. Okay. Um, post-production, what's the specific question? It's just a, a what post well the main thing is what post processing do you use to make your images pop? Is there a and then another question is do you have a basic Lightroom setup no matter what is applied to all images? Uh, another one is, are they straight out of camera, the images that we're seeing tonight? Okay. Um, no, they're not straight out of camera. Uh, I don't use Lightroom. <laughs> and then the other one, that's a, a complicated question, but not. Um, there's some where I do bucket loads of editing, and we'll come to some of those in a bit. But the vast majority of them are a lot less edited than people think they are. Um, what I do is very, 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 very simple, but it's really hard to explain. Um, but in a nutshell, the, the way I give my photos contrast is the very first thing I do is I add a hue and saturation layer in Photoshop. And then I set that blending mode to either multiply or soft light. And that is determined by what the image is going to look like. Um, and if it's multiplied, then it then it requires a lot of masking. Um, and that's the part that takes a lot of time to explain. Um, but that's essentially all I do. Um, that's like the vast chunk of my editing. And then from there, I do like some gray layers to just give it the coloring that I want and desaturate it a little bit. But that's that's really about it, unless it's a composite, which we'll, we'll, we'll come to those in a bit. Great. Thanks, George. No problem. All right, so the next image is a much more, this is your more straightforward, um, almost cliche um, band photo. But I put this for a couple of reasons. Um, one was because this is exactly what they asked for. So sometimes you have bands that will know exactly what it is that they want. Um, and sometimes what they, they say they want is not any good. Um, and then if that's the case, it's your job to kind of throw ideas into how to make that idea a little bit better without saying that it's not a good idea. Just say, oh, you know, it might be a little bit better if we did this. You know, and just tweak their idea. Don't just dismiss it and throw new ideas at them. Um, just tweak it a little bit. So with this, I still like the photo. I don't think it's a bad photo at all. It just, it's much more, um, in my mind, what a bog standard 
band photo, um, but it is what they want. They're a very sort of Arctic Monkeys kind of band, and that was the sort of vibe that we wanted to get with the photo. And they wanted the sort of disconnect with the camera, so that's why we don't have really any of them but the singer looking at the camera. And then the other reason I bring this up, and I'm going to feel really bad for this guy, we're talking about it, but most of the time with the bands, like I said before, you're going to have, uh, they're, they're very comfortable and confident and willing to perform in front of the camera because they're performers. Most of the time, there's always one guy though, who isn't <laughs> um, comfortable in front of the, the, the camera. And it's never the drummer, actually. The drummers are always up for it. Um, it's usually somebody else. And in this one, you can kind of tell which one it is I'm talking about. Um, but it, it's still your job to kind of give him something to do where he's going to feel a little bit more comfortable and try to make it work with him. Um, Sometimes it, it goes away quite quickly. You know, I when I'm working with a band, I'm very much a bubbly, jumping around and kind of making a fool of myself character, and that <coughs> sort of breaks the ice and makes them a lot more comfortable. And I'm very flamboyant when I'm demonstrating poses because I'll demonstrate poses because trying to explain poses I find just never comes across. So I'll get in front and I'll show. I'll say, "This is what I want you to do." Um, and even though earlier I said there's a lot of rules I'll let break with bands, I'm still very posing with a band. I, I, I will tweak them until things are right, and I'll say, oh, tilt your head a little bit, or put your hands in your pockets, or do something different so it looks a little bit better. Um, and that's kind of the whole point of this photo is, is to show that, you know, with the guy that doesn't look terribly comfortable and hopefully he hopefully you guys don't even notice it and it's just me because I know he wasn't comfortable but anyways that's it for that one any questions on this one before we move on to yep. the last of the commission band ones and then we move on yeah there is yes. um, obviously the guy on the uh, the left <laughs> looks like he doesn't want to be in the photograph anyway but the quest the question is the guy on the left looks very strange eyes and his hands cut off was this intentional His hands cut off. I think it's it's in his pocket. Um, oh, there it is because he's got him in his pocket. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, yeah, okay. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, um, there, I, I tried a, a lot of different things with him um, because, and this is going to sound so bad, uh, but he, like I said, he wasn't terribly comfortable. It seemed like in most every shot he just looked off, I guess I can put it. Um, and it, it, at the end of the day, I had to just kind of get it into um, something that looked m more normal um, and then go with it there. And the thing with this is I can't even blame something like lens distortion because this was actually shot on my 70 to 200 lens, um, which is another oddity for me because I usually shoot quite wide. Um, Ah, um, I don't. I don't really have much of an answer for that. <laughs> okay. Um, there was a question about the last image. Just came in late. Um, it says, "What about symmetry?" This is the girl in the bathtub. Uh, what about symmetry? Is the face mm -hmm. reversed to please the subject? If not, how does she see? If not, how does she see here in dissymmetry? Sorry, I'm not reading it wrong. What about symmetry? Is the face reversed to please the subject? If not, how does she see here dissymmetry? Anything on that? That's the shot of the good um, and the bad. Yeah, yeah, I've just flipped back to it. Uh, I'm not sure. I want to refer in just because in. I'm not sure. That If, what was that? Sorry. I wonder if the, it's to do with shooting up on on the subject as a guess. I'm I'm sorry, Barry, who asked the question, not quite getting it through. Perhaps perhaps we'll move on, and Barry can explain a little bit more of his question. We'll kind of come back and revisit that again. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Real. So if you move on, okay. I'll wait for Barry to come so, to come back to me. Thanks, George. 
Yep, no problem. Okay, so this will be the last one of the commissioned band shoots before we then move on to the magazine stuff, because that's a whole different beast. Um, but this one I put in commission, even though I went out to, uh, to, to see Mark in good old Barry, Wales, uh, to shoot this photo. And this is the photo, one of the shoots he was talking about that is on the um, website that you which I haven't seen the video yet, so if you can send me that, cool. Um, but yeah, so this was, was shot for them. It was for a little um, video, uh, and with it, I, was, I, I felt like I had a little bit more freedom to kind of push boundaries with this and still make it relevant to the band. So this is a band from Wales called Florence Black. They're very good. Um, I think that they're, they're, they're in an unfortunate situation of being in Wales, which makes it very hard to get out of musically, but they're doing a pretty damn good job of it. Um, they played Camden Rocks Festival last year, or this year actually, um, and they're, they're making a good push to, to break out of Wales and get into the music scene. They are again a sort of rock band, and I wanted to portray something that was them, and I figure what's more rock and Welsh than the freezing North Sea? And so that's what we did. And it was absolutely freezing in here. So we went in, I went in as well. Um, I had to really let some things fly in here because it was so cold. I couldn't spend a lot of time trying to pose it a bit better. I couldn't worry about the wind blowing their hair, <coughs> um, and I couldn't worry too much about the light because I wasn't actually holding the light, and I didn't have it on a stand. I had uh, Jay holding the light behind me over my head like on a boom, um, and he was freezing as well. Actually, he was probably whining the most of everybody on it, but that's okay. Um, but we couldn't take a lot of time, so this is a good example of one where we got in, and we had minutes to, to do the shot before we had to just get out because it was too cold. The thing with stuff like this, and one of the reasons I put it in there, is that that horizon line, it would be very easy for somebody to take this photo and completely ruin it by having that horizon line in the wrong spot, um, i.e. going through their head or um, something else, really. And so the, the thing with, with a lot of bands, especially if you're going to try to do a shoot where there's going to be some sky involved, is to try to shoot from as low of a perspective as you can with it still looking good. And that's going to give you more drama in the photo. Because the more sky you have in the photo, the more drama there's going to be in the photo. And with this, the only reason I didn't go even lower, uh, normally I probably would have gone even lower. But the only reason I didn't go even lower was I wanted it pretty evident that they were in the sea as well. And I wanted to show some expanse of the sea as well as showing some expanse of the sky. Um, so this was, uh, yeah, I had the guy behind me holding the light and then I tried firing away and posing them while they were freezing in the North Sea in May. Um, and it was really, really cold. But that's pretty much it for this. Um, any questions on this photo? Uh, one says, um, uh, face and body are different colors. Is it a choice or could post-production edit in this particular image? I think I think he's been funny on that one. <laughs> Just about the North of uh, the North Sea part. <laughs> And uh, Ed Flanagan, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's, he's saying fair, the guys in the water shot are brilliant, mate. Loves it. Yeah, thank you. Um, to be fair, what the, you know, he does make a point on the, the, the face body um, color, especially the guy on the left. His chest is extremely white in comparison. But to be honest, those are things I generally don't fix anyways. Like, I'll fix distractions and I'll fix... Um, well, that's my main thing, distractions, like distractions in the background and things that aren't there. But body things like that, I tend not to mess around with. Um, and 
I think it's to kind of like I, I'm worried about annoying or offending the person in the photograph by thinking that I need to fix something. I've known it was a problem. Um, so for stuff like this, I won't. The magazine stuff, which we're coming to, um, I will. Uh, but for this sort of stuff, I, I won't unless they specifically ask for it. Last one on this. But right. One. So, do you shoot yeah. cold or get to meet the subjects beforehand to chat about the shoot? A bit of both. Um, there's there's always at the very least a few emails back and forth where we're or phone calls um, where we're discussing ideas and. I always ask for a link to the music so I can at least get an idea of what they sound like <coughs> because sometimes they'll come to me with an idea for a shoot that just doesn't fit the music whatsoever but a lot of the times it's because they've changed direction and like their new album is actually going to fit and then I'll get links to the new music. Um, so I will say probably with the commission shoots like this I don't ever go into them cold in that sense. There's always been some form of building an idea together um, via email or phone calls. Brilliant, mate. Next shot. I've just posted, by the way, on our Facebook page, um, a link to the film, okay? So for everybody on that, if you want to get over and watch that um, following tonight, uh, then it's there for you. So it's the link. Wait, on the I have it. Either, so I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Next shot, mate. Thanks. All right. So the next five shots, which hopefully I have enough time to talk about, I, I, I tend to talk a lot, so I'm sorry, um, are going to be magazine shots. Um, so, sorry, can you still hear me? Hello? Yeah, we can, George. Okay. Oh, okay, sorry, I had a little thing pop up saying I might be experiencing network issues. But anyway, so... Um, these photos are going to be magazine commissions and there's going to be a variety in here because sometimes I get a very, 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 very specific brief about what they want and then other times I'm given absolute free reign to create whatever I want. This photo, this was for Kerrang! Um, this was very, very, very specific brief as to what they wanted. So. This is Matt Heafy from Trivium, uh, and this was for a feature in Kerrang! just before their new album came out called Silence in the Snow, which is why we have all the snow. Um, so the thing about this photo is I felt really bad for him because he spent an hour and a half in makeup, and it took me all of 10 minutes to shoot this photo, uh, and then he had to go take all that makeup off again. So the concept for it was that Krang wanted him to look like he was frozen in the snow and in a blizzard. So the makeup took care of a good chunk of that for me. Uh, the problem with the makeup, to a point, was that it made his face very, 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 very stiff. So he couldn't really make any facial expressions without cracking the makeup. So this was one of the first shots that we did, and it was basically give me your I'm really pissed off because I'm stuck out in the cold face. And that was this face that he gave me. And it was just shot in the Warner Brothers, where was it, Warner Brothers offices um, against a white background. And then I cut him out and I put this sky background behind him and I put some fake snow on it as well to give it a little bit of depth. Um, and that's it for this photo. It was one light lit like butterfly lighting, but I kind of had it slightly off to the left, so I guess it's more loop lighting. Um, but that was it. It was This one was all about getting it as sharp as I could, getting the right expression, and shooting it at a reasonably small aperture as well, so that there's depth the whole way through the photo. Um, but yeah, that's that's it for that one. Any questions on that? To it, mate, so we'll leave that for now. Okay, so go on then. Yeah, please, George. Okay, so this this was another one for Kerrang! And I've left the full-size version in here because I wanted to explain why as well. 
Uh, but this is a really good example of they came to me with an idea and I said that idea is brilliant but it needs a little bit of a tweak. Um, and then we did that little bit of a tweak and this is what we came up with. So the original idea was she, they wanted a band in space. And originally it was just the four of them sort of all floating. And I said, oh, I think it would be a little bit better, sorry, the three of them all floating. And I said, oh, I think it'd be a little bit better if we can get some depth to the photo. And I said, what if we have one of them, you know, reaching out for a microphone that's floating away? Uh, and then she loved the idea, and so that's what we went with. Um, the reason the bottom half of the photo is pretty much um, empty down here is because that's where all the text went on the article. So this was a one-page feature. I knew that the text was going to take up the bottom half of the page. So when I put this together in Photoshop, I left that bottom half pretty much blank for them to be able to put the text on. Um, everything here was shot in the Kerrang offices, again, against like a white background. <coughs> um, there's a really steep learning curve with some of this, you know, learning how to get a guy to levitate and not seeing bits of a chair that he was sitting on or where a chair flattens some things out. But that stuff's all really complicated to talk about in this little um, time we've got left. Uh, this was all two lights. With this, I felt two lights was really important to have something in the back to separate them from the background. Um, you can definitely see it like on this guy's shoes probably more than anywhere else that I've got that second light hitting there. Um, but yeah, so it was all shot in the Krang offices, and then I created the space background in Photoshop myself. Uh, after watching a few YouTube videos and put it together and whacked them on this uh, space scene that you see. But yeah, any questions on this one? Yeah, so I suppose it's a general question across the images. Um, what format do you shoot with now? So are you looking to shoot square or are you shooting rectangle? Uh, because obviously, you know, you're shooting for PR or is it DVD cover or what's what's the kind of the general spec? What shape do you have to shoot for now? Okay, so that's a very good question. Um, certain ones I'll know exactly what it's going to be for. So like this one in particular, I knew exactly what it was going to be used for. Um, so I shot it to fit that 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 frame. And the same with the album cover one, like. Besides the PR stuff that we did, I knew something was going to be an album cover, and with that, I would try to just because they're they're square but not quite square, so you got to kind of visualize it that way. But generally, yeah, generally, I it depends on what it's going to be used for. Most band stuff will be shot landscape. It's just going to be PR and social media and stuff like that. It'll be landscape. And I'll try to do a couple of landscape where I leave a lot of empty space so they can use it as like their Facebook banner photo. Um, but other ones, like the next photo. Um, uh, before, before you move on, um, lighting of this shot, I know you have shot individual elements. Um, can you just talk yeah. through the basic one, two light position, left, right, high, soft pops, so on, so on? Yeah, yeah. So it was two, two lights. Um, the key light would have been up through a large octobox and it would have been up and off camera right and then I would have had a uh, you can't really draw it but I would have had a another light back here um, behind them all camera left and that was through a, a smaller octobox um, and that's that was it for this it was just the two lights and the light behind was just to as a highlight light a separating light because um, I knew the background was going to be dark and I wanted to make sure that the dark clothes would come out from that. And that was it, really. Just simple, simple two lights on that one. Great. No more questions on that image, mate. Okay. So this photo, this is a good example. This leads into that other question about the format. Um, so this is a band called 21 Pilots. Uh, this was a cover shoot for Rock Sound magazine, and this would have come out in May, June of last year. Um, but the thing, the thing with this is, 
the cover the cover images were were separate they were shot on like a white background but everything on the inside was going to be either a double page uh image or it was going to be a single page and there wasn't going to be much else with that so with this this is when it when it's stuff like that i'll shoot a lot of stuff and especially with this this was when I was using my Nikon D800, which I don't use anymore. Um, but with it being the D800, the file sizes were so massive that I would pretty much shoot everything landscape. And if they needed something for a single full page feature, they could just crop it and it would still have plenty of resolution for that. Um, so that's what this is. This was <laughs> shot with the idea being that it could be a double page with it cropped here, with everything fading out to black here, they would if they were going to use it on double page, they would just fill this bit in with black, and then the text would all go in here like that. Um, and that is with a lot of the magazine stuff I do now. I tend to shoot a lot of stuff with the thoughts of it being a double page, and the image, the subject always being on ideally the left side of the frame because if it's an opening spread for the double page it's usually the subject will be on that left page and then the text will be on that right page um, and that's the idea with that but from a technical standpoint this was probably one of the hardest photos I've ever shot in my life because I went into it not having any idea how bright flares were and I couldn't find any good information online as to how bright a flare was going to be when I when shooting and we only had three flares for the shoot so I didn't have an extra one to sort of mess around with and get my lighting right uh, thankfully I got it right almost straight away the first shot was slightly underexposed and from there on it was all it was all good um, so, uh, or my, my light was, was underexposed, not the flare. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's kind of why I wanted to post this one because that flare, uh, I mean, you never know what's going to be chucked at you. I knew this was coming. I knew that was going to be the basic basis of the shoot, but I still had no idea on how bright a flare was going to be heading into it. And that, that made it a little bit more, uh, nerve wreck wrenching. <laughs> Cool. Uh, I've got a lot yeah. of questions coming through. George, if you could take a few a minute. Yep. Um, where was your first big break from? Hmm. Um, I don't know a big break. If, I, I don't want this to sound weird. Um, I don't know if break is, is, is the right word uh, because I spent, uh, before, I got, before I ever got my first shoot with either Rock Sound or Kerrang!, um, I'd spent three years of calling them on the phone and then occasionally going out to coffee with them and sending them emails every month and really like building a relationship to the point where they said, all right, fine, here, here's a shoot. Um, Rock Sound were the ones that gave me the first, my first magazine shoot uh, that was for Don Broco back in... God, I don't know, 2014 or something like that. Um, and then at the tail end of last year, Kerrang! kind of poached me from Rock Sound. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it, it's been a matter of, of ringing and, and building a relationship and um, getting them to trust me, really. Cool. Hopefully um, that answers that. Question, um, sub, somebody's just been to see the new um, Oasis film with images a lot from Jill Furmanowski. And, okay, the, quest, uh, the question is, how important is behind-the-scenes images um, for social media today as well as the actual shoot? Recently seen the Oasis ah. film with Jill Furmanowski's images, basically bands at play. So how important are behind-the-scenes shots, I suppose? Right, that's a very good question and a very relevant question nowadays, I would say. Um, the reason why I say it, I just did a shoot on, what what is today, Tuesday, I think it's Tuesday. 
on last Friday, I think. I'm trying to see my diary. Um, oh, there it was, last Thursday. And it was to do some portraits for an artist, um, but it was also to be the sort of behind the scenes photographer for a music video, which I had never done before. And it was really, really cool to do. And what the person that just asked this question said is entirely why they wanted it done. Their thinking was, we'll get somebody out to do some portraits because we're going to need those to go along with this music video as well. But by having the behind the scenes stuff of that music video being made, they've now got bucket loads of, of content for social media to sort of tease that video when it comes out. Um, and that, I think, is going to be something we see a lot more of. So like this shoot, this image you see here, this 21 Pilots one, um, there must have been about 10 people at this shoot, and all of them were taking pictures of me taking pictures on their phone. And when I got home, like I was just tagged in like 50 photos online from different people, and I had no idea what was going on. And it happens all the time now, which is why I also, at the end of every shoot that I do, I take a selfie with with whoever it is I'm photographing, and it's for that very reason. It's it's for social media, but also for my son when I get too old to do this, and hopefully he can stumble upon these and see that I was actually kind of cool one day. Um, but yeah, I think behind the scenes stuff is something we're going to see a lot more of now. That was a really long answer to that question. No, no, hopefully a good one. I think it's so relevant, brilliant. Uh, one more question, if you don't mind, before we move on to the next photograph, because it's been asked yep. so many times. Um, so if you're not using the D800 now, is is kind of that theme that's running through about 25 questions here. What what do you use now, mate? <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm now a Fuji convert. <laughs> um, I I was given a Fuji XT2 um, to try out a few months ago. Uh, and I absolutely loved it. I love everything about it, and I have converted to that. And I don't want to get into that too much because I don't want to sound like a Fuji salesman or whatever, but Fuji XC2 is what I use now, and I love it. And the speed light to go along with those then? But it's all, Sorry, if you don't mind me butting in, I think you said that it's pretty much all Elinchrom, isn't it, not speed light now? Yeah, yeah, it's all Elinchrom. Um, lighting that I use, with the exception of this odd interfit strobies that I use when I need the fourth light, <laughs> which isn't very often. But. Okay, back back to you. More photographs. Okay. What's that? Photographs, please. Okay, so next one. This is same guys, um, but about a year later, and for a different magazine. I think you can tell from the drumsticks. Uh, this was for Rhythm magazine. And it was supposed to be mostly on the guy on the left, Josh, the drummer. But as they are just a two-person band, I figured I would get them both in there. Now, this is one of those times. Rhythm give me sort of free reign to do whatever I want uh, when I do shoots with them. Um, there's obviously certain things I need to make sure I get. Uh, but within getting those certain things, it's up to me how I get those things. And this photo was um, one of those uh, amazing moments. Um, if anybody doesn't know 21 Pilots, um, this, what they're making with their drumsticks is the 21 Pilots logo just reversed. Uh, and it just sort of happened. I don't think it could have been done intentionally because They've never done a shoot for a drumming magazine before, so I can't imagine they've made the their logo with drumsticks previously. Um, but it's one of those that just sort of happened, and it's become one of my favorite photos. There's a lot of other fun photos with them, because one of the nice things when you work with a band once and then you work with them again, they generally remember who you are, and you have a really good rapport, and you can you know mess around for a bit and do some funny things. Um, but yeah, this was one of those, I found a nice black wall, I sat him down, I gave him drumsticks, and this is what happened. Yeah. Um, I know we're running out of time, so I'm trying to go quick. <laughs> Any questions on this before I move to the next one? No, we'll leave the questions until we finish the images now, George. I know your time's precious, mate. 
Okay. Oh, I'm fine. I just don't want to take up too much of everybody else's. Um, I can go all night. Um, right. So the next photo is again for Rhythm Magazine, and it's a band called Slaves. Um, and again, this was I put this one in here because it was one of those things that just happened. Um, but also, I wanted to talk about what you're seeing them shot against. So this was at this tiny, well not tiny, it was massive, but absolutely crowded studio in Henley-upon-Thames, I think is the name of the town. Um, I got lost trying to get there because it was in the woods. Uh, but when I got there, it was an amazing place, but it was so full of stuff, there was nowhere to shoot. And then I kind of saw through this doorway, this storage room, and one of those red office cubicle dividers. Um, and I said, oh my god, can we just move that a little bit? And then I used that to do the entire shoot um, because it was the only sort of normal thing I could find that would look good. Um, so my little advice on that is don't dismiss anything that you see from um, a location to use it because I think most people might have just dismissed that red cubicle divider, but I saw a massive opportunity there. And then this photo just sort of happened again. Um, we'd done a lot of other things before this one in particular, and then Isaac just sort of randomly stuck the drumsticks up his nose. And it's the look on, um, oh, what's his name, Louis? Uh, Lauren. Um, just looking at him like, what the hell are you doing? Uh, that just makes this, this photo for me. Um, and it's different for me because I, I tend to control so much with my photos that it's nice when I get something I didn't control. Um, but again, this was one light um, pretty much right above my head. Um, yeah, and that's it. And that's it for the magazine stuff. So the, the, the rest of this stuff is going to be the live stuff, which is where I said I would address um, passes and whatnot. So that, I'll talk about that really quick because that's a tricky one. Um, your best bet for starting out, and it's not going to give you the best photos, unfortunately, um, but is to start with your biggest uh, local uh, venues and get in touch with the promoters that are putting on the shows and try to get photos, <coughs> try to get photo passes that way. Um, because once you get to the bigger shows, uh, you, you, you're never going to get a photo pass unless you're being sent there by somebody to take photos for them, whether that be the artist themselves or uh, a magazine or the record label or whatever it is, a blog, um, somebody's sending you to take those photos and they'll usually sort those passes out. Getting them on your own is, well, I've never done it <laughs> uh, in that aspect. From the smaller shows, the smaller venues like here in Cambridge, I can get them quite easily if I wanted to. And that's just getting in touch with the promoter. You might have to give them a little, you know, I'll give you a couple of photos if you get me a pass, that sort of thing. And to start out with, that's that's perfectly fine. Um, the, thing, the reason why I said at the beginning of that sentence is that it's not going to give you the greatest photos is the thing with live photography is that it is so much dependent upon the menu um, and the lighting setup that you've got. Generally speaking, you're not allowed flash at, at shows. That's not true with the smaller ones, but my philosophy has always been, right, I'm not allowed flash at the bigger venues, so I'm not going to use flash at the smaller venues, even though I can. And the reason is that it doesn't help me to sort of cheat at the smaller venues and then not know what I'm doing at the bigger venues. So I try to create what I can with what I'm given at the smaller venues and then work on making that better. Now there's only so much you can do if there is no lighting on the face or they've just got lights behind them or they've just got 
hideous red light shining on him the whole show. I get that. There's not much you can do about that. Um, the thing with the live photography is that it is so dependent upon the lighting that you're given. But saying that, if it's in a decent venue, like this, well, I can't say decent venue. This was at the O2 Arena. Um, this was a, a brilliant lighting setup, as you can see. There's there's light on her face. There's a red light above her, which isn't on her face, which is brilliant because red lights on the face is nightmare. Those photos always go to black and white. Um, but the red light is highlighting on her hair, and it all makes it look nice. The downside to this photo, and the reason I put it in here, is that the stage was too high. Um, and I think you can see that from the perspective I was shooting at. I mean, the pit area was a bit narrow, so I couldn't go back any farther. And she was right up at the front of the stage for the vast majority of the show. And then with the stage being that high, it just I, I just don't like the perspective that much. But I still think it's a pretty good photo. Um, when you have nice lighting like this, your settings are going to be pretty easy. This was ISO 400, I think, um, 1 25th of a second, and 2.8. Um, if I had a 1.8 lens, I would go to that, but I only have 2.8 lenses. A lot of the times with the smaller venues, it's going to be ISO 800 at least. But with live stuff, I try not to go below 1 25th of a second because anything below that you're going to start getting motion blur. It's depending on who's playing. Um, you don't have the flash to freeze the motion like you would if you were adding your own light to it. So you're going to get motion blur and it can look good though. So that's why I say generally, um, but depending on who it is or what you're trying to do, that motion blur can look really good. But if you don't want it, try to stay above 1 25th of a second. So that's that photo. <coughs> This photo is actually from that behind the scenes music video thing I was talking about that I shot last week. It was from a mock performance. Um, and I put this in here because like, this was one of those where you're at the mercy of whatever lighting um, is being thrown at you. Now you wouldn't know it from looking at this picture, but they had an amazing lighting setup. Oh, I thought, and then they decided to only use one of the lights they'd set up at a time. So they had one massive softbox straight above, and then behind would have been one really bright spotlight, and then the floor she's standing on lit up as well. And when all three of those were on at the same time, it looked amazing, uh, but they never did that. <laughs> they only did one at a time. And so with this, with the light coming from above, every shot I took, I had to wait for her to sort of lift her chin. Anything where she wasn't lifting her chin up was going to be a completely useless shot because there was going to be absolutely no light on her face. And so when you're shooting shows, it's important to pay attention to what the lighting's doing and how it's falling on the people that you're photographing. And then if you know the music, that's even better because then you can time things. Like if you know a song's going to do something at a certain spot, you can kind of wait for the band or the singer or whatever to do something at that point. But if you don't know, then just keep an eye on them. But keep an eye on the lighting as much as you can and see what it's doing. So like I said, with this light that was directly above them, I didn't take any shot unless her head, her chin was up a little bit because there was no point in taking shots otherwise. Um, and that's, that's important. And then sometimes you get ridiculous lighting setups like this. Now this, in my mind, is not the greatest photo in the world. I think my composition could have been a lot better um, and all sorts of things with it. But it was also one of the first big shows that I photographed. And um, I was really lucky with a truly extraordinary lighting setup that these guys had. Um, I mean, you can see all the lights they had behind them. But they also had these massive floodlights down in front of every single one of them. 
so they were always being lit <clears throat> and it made it just made my job so much easier I could just at that point when essentially they were constantly being lit um, I didn't have to sit around and wait for the right moment to take a photo I could just in terms of lighting I could then just wait for moments to take photos of and not worry about the lighting not being right and then you have other times again where the lighting is really great but the stage setup is awful like or the band just doesn't do a lot um, so this is Wheatus uh, and I'd never seen Wheatus before and I didn't know that he pretty much just stands at that microphone and doesn't really do anything the whole time <laughs> um, but we had great lights and he didn't move from that spot and I tried various lenses I tried my wide lens I tried my long lens I tried moving around a bit in the pit but the problem is in the pit you've got other photographers you got to be very mindful of them and not get in their way and so sometimes once you get your spot you're kind of stuck in that spot and then you usually only have three songs to get those those shots in um, and if they don't do anything they don't really do anything and so of the three songs for Wheatus this was the most emotion I got out of them <laughs> um, from a photograph perspective but again the light was really really good there was always a spotlight on them and there was always this light behind them lighting up the smoke um, and then even a small venue like this this is in Cambridge this is the junction um, which is a pretty small venue uh, but this was um, um, Soulfly uh, and they had a tremendous lighting setup again. This is one where it was most certainly ISO 800 at a minimum. Um, this was an older shot, so this would have actually been on my 50 mil 1.8 on my Nikon. Uh, so that's how I would have been able to get away with ISO 800 on this, because even though it looks rather exposed, it was still quite dark. Um, and so it would have been ISO 800 probably 1 25th of a second and then 1.8 I know this was 1.8 because I know this was shot on that 50 mil um, but this was one where I just I think this summed up the show pretty much to me it was all about just heavy you know screaming Max Cavalera just screaming and uh, yeah it was it was awesome um, but yeah, I think that sums it up. I know there's going to be a lot of questions, so I tried to go. There's not a lot to talk about with the live stuff because so much is out of your control. Um, but I know you'll have questions about that, and hopefully I can answer that. So, Mark, if you want to fire away any questions you got. Yep, got quite a few, but there is a similarity in them, to be honest, bud. So it's not going to be a huge amount left to do. Um, let's go really backwards, first of all, and go... Um, how, how did you transition from standard promos to more creative? Do you practice more creative work with band commission shots? Uh, there seems to be more themes or post-production with publication work. That's from Connie. She's been waiting a very long time for that, an that answer. Okay, that, that's a good question, actually. Um, so um, it might look like that, I think, purely because of the images I chose to show, partly. Um, but... So an interesting thing happened a long time ago when I first started shooting bands. Um, I was really, really, really into doing composites. And at the time, like composites kind of didn't have any place in the magazine world. And um, I kind of got away from it a little bit and I started shooting just more in camera stuff but still trying to keep it really creative and the bands give the, the direct commissions from bands gave me a lot of freedom to do some really creative things you wouldn't know it too much from what I've shown you here tonight but but they did and then when it finally came time for Kerrang to, to start using me um, they knew I could do composites and so they kind of took advantage of that for a few shoots um, and that's where you've got those guys in space, you know, because they just knew it was something I would be able to do. Um, and then sometimes I think with the, with the magazines, especially with Kerrang, not so much the other ones, 
but with Kerrang, they usually have very creative, thought out briefs, um, which is brilliant for me because then it just gives me the opportunity to just do something awesome um, without having to think of the ideas myself. Because a lot of times I would think of these bonkers ideas on my own and I would just go do personal projects. I'm a big fan of personal projects and just if you got a crazy idea, just go out and shoot it. I hope that answered that question. If it may, <laughs> thank you. Just a quick one on copyright. Who owns it? Who owns the cop uh, the copyright for the photographs? Oh, uh, I do. Um, um, yeah, that is a <sighs> okay. So with the live stuff, is the probably the only place that you might see something different, and that is because some bands will have. Um, ridiculous forms for you to fill out before you're allowed to take photos and some of those bands will try to claim the copyright from you and then when that comes up I just won't sign the, the paper um, but when it comes to like the, the, the direct commissions from the bands I will always maintain the copyright for that and I'm very clear on the price that I give them that the, the initial price I'm giving them is PR only, um, so they can't use the photos on anything they're going to sell. Once they want to start putting it on a t-shirt or an album cover or a poster um, or anything they're going to sell, then we need to start talking about license fees. And and license fees is, is where you would make more money doing the band stuff that way. And the same with the live stuff. If you can, haven't signed any crazy agreement, um, you can then license those images out uh, to different people, hopefully the band themselves. But um, the magazine stuff, again, it would be me, uh, but I kind of have like a respect thing with that. So like a lot of the, so like the Trivium photo, the one where he's covered in snow, there's a lot of photos from that shoot that are really awesome. And they're never going to see the light of day with anything. So I'll probably then sell those as prints at some point. What I'll never do though, and this is just out of like a respect thing, is I'll never sell the print of the image that was in the magazine. Um, and that's just because I don't want to do that. Like I figured that was Karang's image. I'm going to let them have that for that's it. And then I'll just sell the other ones. Cool. So, um, Zoom or Prime? Uh, zooms now, I'll, and that's that's down to a time constraint thing more than anything else. I used to like primes a lot, uh, but because so often I'll only have, you know, with the magazine stuff, I might have 15 minutes, I might have an hour, I might have five minutes. Um, what I don't have is usually a lot of time <laughs> um, to faff about with changing lenses. So I've I've come to really like zooms for that aspect because then I can just recompose that way as opposed to running across the room to recompose or having to change my lens. Okay, uh, two more questions mate, that's it then. Um, interesting one now in fact, are, are you being asked for video for social media uh, for social media to shoot at the same time as stills now? Um, that is a good, <coughs> a good question. And the answer is kind of a yes. Um, so the first example would be for some of the instructional magazines I shoot for, like Total Guitar and Guitarist. When I first started shooting for them, they mentioned that you know they might ask me to, at the end of the shoot, uh, shoot a little video. Um, and I said, OK, that's cool. Uh, but that hasn't actually happened. Um, but I'm kind of still waiting for that to happen because I think that is going to happen. And then the same with the live stuff. Like I have had a client ask me to shoot a little bit of photos of the of the show and then try to get like little 10 to 20 second snippets of video. Um, and that's really hard to do at a live show, by the way. <laughs> but uh, that's a, that's a different learning curve. But the short answer is yes, and I think we'll see more of that coming as well.
Brilliant. Um, and then this is one question that basically sums up must be 30 questions that's asking the same thing. It's obviously all about live shows. It's all about exposure. It's all about color balancing. Um, can you just kind of talk them through it? Because uh, there's so many questions there, but they're all about the same thing. They're asking the same question, but it's in a 25 different ways. So I'm not sure if there's an easy way to answer it as far as is it... <coughs> Uh, manual exposure, um, is it in program mode, are you setting a set color balance, do you have a preferred set, oh, set in, and so on and so on, mate. Just quickly on that, if you could. For the live, the live stuff? Yeah. I'm guessing? It is for the okay. live stuff, yeah, mate. So, yeah, so I, I, I always shoot it manual mode, so it's all um, manual. But the thing is, the, the lights are never going to change too much from your the, the first note of the first song. Yeah, there might be some odd moments where like all the lights go off or a couple of lights go off. But for the most part, they're not going to change too much. They're just going to be moving around and changing color. So once you get this, the, the exposure that you want, um, there's generally no need to change it from there. And so it's always in manual mode, and it's usually somewhere in the neighborhood of 2.8 ISO 800, 1 one twenty fifth of a second. It's usually that's that's usually what I'll start with. That'll be my test shot exposure setting, and then I'll adjust accordingly from there. Um, in terms of color balance, that is the I always just leave the white balance on auto, and then I worry about it later because sometimes. Like I said, if you're just getting red lights on their faces the whole time, there's nothing you can do about that except make that photo black and white. Um, and the same with blue. You get sometimes where they just get blue lights on their faces. And again, just make that photo black and white <laughs> um, because it's never going to look right. Beyond that, they're usually no different than the than any other lights you see. They're always, when they are white lights on their faces, like on the photo that I still have up here, and you can probably see it on there, when they do have white lights, they're always a touch on the warm side, which I like, and I usually just leave it like that. I usually don't, don't neutralize that warmness. I kind of just leave that warmness there. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's so dictated by what, you're going to be presented with in terms of lighting and then the white balance and the color balance is is you just put your white balance in auto and run with it <laughs> basically brilliant mate what a great webinar george we've had so much feedback so positive you just wouldn't believe thanks for spending some time with us tonight uh, remember you can head over oh. to uh, george's web uh, website to see more uh, gfphoto.co.uk with it um, George, just just before we finish, mate, thank you again from me and the Academy. But are, are you doing any talks at the uh, convention at the SWPP in London this January? I am. I'm doing uh, three talks. I'm doing one super class on the Saturday. Oh, crap. I can't remember if this is Saturday or Sunday. Um, but one super class on composites. So if you want to learn and see a composite shot and edited and put together from start to finish, that would be the one to come to. Um, and then I'm doing two master classes kind of on the business side of things. Um, one is on um, dealing with rejection, basically, when people tell you no or they tell you not yet, which has been where I'll talk about my experiences with getting in with rock sound and Kerrang and the like. Um, and then the other one is on not waiting to be discovered and things you can do to actively get yourself out there and get work instead of waiting for people to find you. Awesome, mate. And fingers crossed we'll try and put some uh, workshops together next year, yeah? It'll be great to actually see you live yeah. in action. Yeah. Uh, we'll try and get them down to the account. Mm. So if you're interested in a um a work workshop uh either down with us with george or actually doing one of his own then let us know it'd be great to actually hear all the feedback uh, i've posted uh, some of the links already um for you all on our facebook page as well as during the chat box um so thanks george again from me and the academy cheers mate uh, i've just got to actually just do yeah. a little bit of a, an end if that's okay but i'll see you in january i'll buy you another pint yeah sounds good thank you very much thanks george